You're watching a joint production of Illinois Channel and Public Affairs with my good friend, Terry Martin. We're gonna be doing a lot on Illinois spending and taxes and social issues. I mean, this session is, we're taping this on May 11th. And uh, I guess we got like 19, 20 days left till the end of the session. They got to wrap up the budget, the progressive income tax, maybe something on abortion, maybe something on guns, the capital bill. It's a lot going on, right, Terry? There's a lot going on, Jeff, and uh, it, we won't be able to pack all of it into a half an hour show, but we're going to try to focus on some of the major things that people are going to want to know about because they're really going to be impacted. This is one of the more uh, important spring sessions in at least four years because the last four years, as you know, uh, were just pretty much marked by the standoff between Governor Rounder and the Democrats, but now the Democrats are controlling the board and they're moving the board moving some major issues and so they're addressing both the budget they got a capital bill they've got a whole host of uh, things a lot of economic issues that are going to be impacting people and we're going to get into that and jeff uh, one of the big issues is of course governor pritzker's efforts to have a progressive income tax uh, that will change it from the flat tax and it's the tax that uh, he says uh, is going to be only raising the tax on about three percent of the people the Republicans are not having hardly any of that. They say, you know, what protects the middle class is this flat tax. And once you get rid of that, once you go to a progressive tax, well, then you can move those rates uh, on taxing people uh, just by passing a bill in the legislature. Um, and it's already passed the Illinois Senate a, on a party line vote with just Democrats. And as you know, Terry, the speaker has 74 Democrats. He only needs 71 in the state house. But you know, he's already lost, or two are saying they're they're not so sure. They're concerned. The folks in the northwest side of Chicago, Jonathan Carroll in the 57th district, and uh, uh, and, and and Yingling up in Gray's Lake, who many say those are two folks who are on borrowed time. They used to be Republican areas, so he, they're going to be concerned. And you know what those folks are concerned about? They're raising taxes, and they don't believe what they're being told about there'll be a reduction in property taxes. So the Republicans don't have enough votes in either the House or Senate to really stop the Democratic steamroller, or at least not not yet. Uh, on the progressive tax, the Republicans, the only power they have is maybe the bully pulpit. Let's listen to uh, some of the comments the Republicans made at a press conference earlier. We had Representative Deanna Mazaki, a new freshman, uh, from Westmont. Let's listen to her comments as she talks against going to a progressive tax. When people say that they're in favor of it, it's when they're at an income level where they don't think they're going to have to pay the increased amount. As soon as people start believing that they actually will have to start paying that increased amount, then the support actually starts to drop dramatically. And that's, I think, why this is why one of the, this is important for us to actually have this in place, is because we want people to be able to realize that if, in fact, the Senate um, and the House and the legislators here in Springfield are not willing to lock in those rates and they're not willing to commit to a supermajority, you know, if they really wanted to actually say that the bottom 97% don't get a tax increase, why are they not saying let's reduce that down to 3.25%? The reason why they're not doing that is because they know they need the money of the working class and the middle class in order to balance their spending budget. There you go. So uh, that's, that's what the uh, Republicans are saying and they hope to uh, convince enough people around the state uh, because the state voters ultimately, as we said before, uh, the state voters are going to have to approve a constitutional amendment before the progressive tax can come in. The Republicans are saying it's the flat tax that is protecting you from having those rates go down and increasing the tax on the middle class. And they, they kind of say that, uh, you know, this progressive tax on just the top 3% is a bit of snake oil, Jeff. Well, Representative Mazaki is a fresh new voice from the far west suburbs, Westmont, uh, far west suburbs of the Chicago metro area. And you saw it in 45 seconds, she laid out the argument. She said, look, they need that money. If they really need the middle class, they'd say to the middle class, hey, we'll lower your rates back to what they were before we raised them, 3.25. Or tell you what, we'll go along with what the Republicans want, 60% supermajority to raise taxes, you know, in the future. Uh, but they're not doing it. And so she put that out there. She's, she's quite articulate. And, um, you know, we'll see 
We'll see how this goes in the next few weeks. Uh, you know, if I were Speaker Madigan, I'd be a little concerned. As as you said, the only if the Republicans hang tough, he only needs 71 of his 74 votes. He could lose three. There are already two on the fence. And, uh, you know, the property tax is a big deal because it's not just that you're raising income taxes, at least on the top 3%. You already said to be having the highest property taxes in the country. And so what the Democrats are saying, they're adding to this proposal a freeze on pro property taxes. Well, if you have the highest taxes in the country for property taxes, how does it help you to freeze? You're freezing very high taxes. That's number one. And there's so many caveats. First, you have to get the progressive income tax passed to get that freeze. Then you have to get these large, uh, large amounts of additional spending for the next decade. $350 million a year. Well, you know, if let, they don't do that, let me interject that. One, of, tax freezes off. one of the things the uh, Democrats are saying, uh, they're also taking to the uh, press room to talk to the press. And this is how the game is played, people. Uh, you know, you they're, they're all having the battle of the press trying to get their message out on top. And uh, when the Republicans are saying, you know, these rates can be changed if we go to a progressive tax and it can be lowered to take in the middle class, not just tax the upper income. You know, one of the things that was kind of a surprise this past week is the state reported an extra $1.5 billion in tax revenue because the national economy is boiling. And that means that uh, the growth that we're now seeing is producing more tax revenue as frankly was predicted by someone you interviewed recently, Steve Moore, uh, the economist, and he was one of the architects of uh, President Trump's tax cut at the national level. But you know, Jeff, uh, let's listen to what Senator Don Harmon and uh, State Senator Toy Hutchison, they were saying, you know, that was great, but uh, this new money doesn't mean that we don't need a increase in the uh, taxes. Uh, the truth is that manna from heaven may get us out of the desert, but it will not feed us for years to come. Uh, this really emphasizes the need to pass the fair tax and to put this question in front of the voters so that we can reform our antiquated income tax structure and uh, pay for the government that people expect from the state and also provide the long-term path to tackling the property tax issues. And to, it was amazing to hear that $1.15 billion would out of all all of a sudden um, solve uh, 3.4 billion in a structural deficit, 15 billion in backlog of bills, and 150 billion in a pension crisis. Um, that's pretty magical for just 1.15 billion. So, I so there you go. Well, you know, yeah, Harmon, Senator Harmon, Representative Hutchinson, they, they, they kind of missed the point. Notice how Harmon says manna from heaven. No, it wasn't manna from heaven. As you said, it, it, it was President Trump's uh, economy. I mean, in 2018, this country had 3% real GDP growth. In the first quarter of this year, 2019, they had 3.2%. In the last year of the Obama administration, 2016, it was 1.5%. People don't realize those numbers, when you go from 1.5% growth to 3%, you're talking trillions. You're talking tremendous amounts of money that affect every, not every, but most states in this country, maybe every state. So Illinois should look at that and say, hey, we didn't get 1.5 billion from manna from heaven. We got 1.5 billion from having much higher growth than was occurring under the Obama administration and that we anticipated. And then maybe Illinois should do some reforms that pushes up Illinois GDP on its own in addition to what's happening nationally. Because the more growth you have, the more wealth you create, the less you have to tax individuals. Uh, in terms of percent, you can have a broad based low percent if wealth is growing for Illinois. If the pie is growing, you don't have to sit in here and fight about, you know, who pays and what part of the pie because you have much more. And I think both of those, they're articulate, they're thoughtful. It's, you know, it's that point of view. And, I'm glad we're showing all points of view, but I think they missed the point and we need to have more of that debate. We need to have more. It'd be great, wouldn't it, if, um, if the state of Illinois could see this clash of ideas with Republicans and Democrats debating this issue in the Illinois legislature and outside of it. 
you know jeff one of the things as we talk about the progressive income tax and this is the thing that people just to remind them that that has to go on the concert constitutional amendment has to go on the ballot in november of two thousand and twenty which means that even if they pass that bill we're not going to uh, have any of that revenue coming in until 2021 and it's not a give me that we're going to get that passed by the voters on the november 2020 ballot uh, so what's happening is we're looking at other sources of revenue around the state and you know we we talked about some of this where one of the things they're talking about is expanding casino gambling they're talking about expanding sports betting and another thing they're looking to do, and, and they just announced this a week ago as we sit here, uh, is to legalize recreational marijuana. They're looking to have licenses for that, and they think that that would raise right there at least $200 million. So, you know, now that the state got that extra $1.5 billion, uh, it means on one hand that what the, where the governor was going to underfund the pensions, which we've had that happen before, uh, they were going to cut that by $800 million. Now the state has the money to go ahead and pay that and not underfund it. And, of course, the governor also took some flack on that. But on that topic of, uh, of the recreational marijuana, there was a lot of work going on behind the scenes here, and it's more than just allowing recreational marijuana. They talked about tax issues. They talked about the impact of policing, what it's going to mean, and trying to make sure that people aren't, driving while they're stoned, that they can't be smoking it out in the public. Uh, and also there's going to be a, an aspect of, uh, by, by legalizing this, they want to go through and, and look at expunging the criminal records of some of those who were arrested in the past because they're saying, you know, it's not kind of fair to have these people walking around with felony convictions while now, now it's legal. And that's been a real problem. Um, one of those uh, on those uh, six working groups on the recreational marijuana was the lieutenant governor. She spoke uh, pretty emotionally uh, last Saturday as this was announced and how she thinks this is so important for getting the community, the black and the Hispanic communities, back to where they can be participating in the growth of this new industry, but also to get those criminal records removed from some people's uh, uh, record so that they can go out and get jobs again. Let's take a look to the comments that uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton made a week ago. For too many years, communities were ravaged by the failed war on drugs. People and their families were trapped in cycles of incarceration for a small mistake, often committed when they were very young. Many were marked as felons and forced to carry a label that limited their ed education and economic opportunity. Families were torn apart as loved ones were sent to institutions that disconnected them from their families and communities, and babies exhibited the generational consequences of being raised without a father or perhaps a mother because their parent languished behind bars for the exact same offense that someone else from another community would have suffered no consequence. Mm -hmm. All paid for by taxpayers. The Lieutenant Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor having some uh, strong emotions there, and understandably so. And Jeff, uh, do you have any reaction to what she was saying? Yeah, I mean, it was an important speech. And um, this whole discussion, I saw that, and it's on your, people can see this uh, on, uh, you know, your video page on youtube.com slash Illinois Channel TV. And I think that whole discussion went about 35 minutes or so and five minutes or so was what Lieutenant Governor Stratton was saying. And it was very important because it's not, as you say, just an additional source of revenue to have legalization of marijuana. It's to try to correct some of these social injustices that occurred before and are still occurring and that are very important, especially important to the minority community. So that having been said, and, and I acknowledge that, and I think it's great that you, you, you pulled that clip, just to go back for a second, because I know we got to go out and we got to get the capital bill and other things and abortion and so forth. Um, we kind of glossed over. There was that 1.5 billion that came in. It affected two budgets. It's important because fiscal 19, fiscal 2019 budget ends next month. And 1.5 billion of that money came in and 1.1 billion went to really smooth over and polish off some of the rough edges of that budget. 
which may have been balanced, maybe not. Now I think they can make a stronger argument. It's truly balanced, fiscal 2019. And about 400 million went to local distributed, local governments through the local distributed fund. But then there's the fiscal 2020 budget, which is being passed presumably in this session and will be covering the next fiscal year starting July 1. And that's the one where the governor was planning to take a pension holiday. Well, they took 800. What they've said is since we had so much growth in us last year that we didn't expect in Illinois, we expect enough growth next year where we can plan on $800 million making the pension payment out of money as opposed to taking a pension holiday. I flagged that, Terry, and then we got to go on just to say people need to be reminded there is a $200 billion hole still, $200 billion hole in Illinois pensions, and nothing really is being done about it. So we're focusing on a lot of things, but not on that. We're not amending the Constitution to deal with that, which we could to, to allow those benefits to be reduced. We're not giving, currently, we're not going to have the legislature give cities and villages, including Shep Chicago, the power to file for bankruptcy, which would help them deal with it. So there's a big 800 pound gorilla in the room, and that's the pension hole in Chicago and Illinois. And maybe someday, Terry, we got to do a show that focuses just on that. You know, let's uh, let's talk about uh, when we this is easy to get confused, people, because there's a lot of things and they're kind of coming together, you know, and, as parts. So you have the budget you Jeff was just talking about. We also have uh, the capital budget. And that's, of course, where we fund these big ticket items, construction items, uh, roads, bridges, buildings. And there's been hearings going on around the state. Uh, and this is going to be measured in, in billions of dollars. But, uh, you know, the state, therefore, is they're looking for all sorts of revenue sources. The marijuana was just one. Uh, they're looking to increase the gas tax. I mean, we'll come back to that in a second. They're also, for all those who are into video gaming, uh, they're looking to do that. They're looking to increase casinos. And there's some discussion about, are they going to have one big gaming bill? Is Speaker Madigan going to select one and go, you know, maybe we'll look at some of these others? And I'll tell, from, tell people from having covered the state capitol in the end of the session uh, for 20 years, uh, when, you, when you get down to the last two weeks in May, it ends up being scrambled eggs because everyone's walking around with rumors, uh, and the rumors fly fast about just what's going to happen. And frankly, it's almost impossible for anyone to sit here and tell you precisely what's going to end up being baked into the omelet, so to speak. But one of the things that is being discussed, Jeff, is uh, the governor is proposing to increase the tax on video gaming around the state and to go from the current 30 percent to 50 percent. Now, maybe that flies in some places, but this follows that the governor just increased the minimum wage to $15 an hour. That will be effective in 2025. And a lot of small business in, businesses uh, in downstate are saying, boy, uh, how are we going to afford that uh, $15 an hour minimum wage? That's uh, up about 75 percent of our salaries uh, from what we are currently. One of the reasons they thought maybe they could afford that in some of these smaller communities is because of the money they get from video gaming. But recently I had the opportunity to talk to two gentlemen who run small businesses in southern Illinois. They gave me their reaction to what would happen if that video gaming tax goes from 30 percent to 50 percent. Probably half of the uh, income is derived, half or more, is from video uh, gaming. In our two smaller places, which are strictly bars, uh, it, it, it is our income. I mean, it, it constitutes maybe as much as 75 percent of our income. And there's a lot of locations that are dependent upon it 100 percent. In so much when I say that, without that income stream, they're gone. You know, so this, I mean, this whole t massive tax they're talking about could really have tremendous adverse effects on small businesses. So uh, not very uh, good news for those who run small businesses. And one of the other people, we don't have him included in this bite, but it was uh, AMVETS. And so even some of these nonprofits, and they're saying, you know, we put a lot of money back into our communities, and we survive by the money that's coming in as a nonprofit to, uh, uh, from those video gaming stuff. But anyway, again, indicative of the kind of 
hunt for new revenues that the governor is looking for, the Democrats are looking for to try to plug that budget hole that you were mentioning in the 2020 budget? Well, again, the, the big picture here, the big drivers of, it, of spending on the budgets, before we get to the Capitol bill, which we're on, you know, it's education, it's pensions, Medicaid. You don't reform any of that. You got 75% of the, of the budget just continue to blossom and grow. And then you say, oh, well, we got to take care of, you know, the roads and other infrastructure. So we need a capital bill because we haven't had a capital bill in about 10 years. And usually these things are like 10 or $15 billion maybe or less. But now people are starting to talk 25 or 30 billion. Well, you know, as Eb Dirksen used to say, a billion here and a billion there. And before you know it, you're talking real money. I mean, you know, you got a $40 billion budget and you're taxing the hell out of people and you're raising the progressive income tax on the wealthy and you're driving the wealthy out. And that means you got to go to the middle class. And then you got, okay, then you got the capital bill. And what are you going to do? There's a fuel tax, which we'll get to maybe. And what are we talking about there? Maybe raising the fuel tax 100%. And this guy says we're raising the video gaming tax 50%. So folks, spending's nice. You got constituencies, you say you're doing what they want, but you know, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And the people downstate are not doing so well in terms of jobs. They find this is sort of a salvation, is video gaming. And then this invisible hand of Governor Pritzker reaches in and say, I want my hand. 50%, that's what he wants. And, you know, and the same thing with the fuel tax. So, you know, we need to clash of ideas of Republicans and Democrats. We can't just raise taxes and have a small group of people. You know, as you say, the mushrooms, most of the 177 legislators, they say, are kept in the dark like mushrooms. Um, we need, you've highlighted a problem. What we don't have is the solution, is the solution to reduce spending and get reforms, or is the solution to keep raising taxes or issuing debt. Do we really want to say we're going to issue $30 billion in bonds for a capital fund? Okay, that's going to be what? Added to the $200 billion in pensions? You know, I, I was talking to uh, someone recently and who's uh, very familiar with this, uh, and he was saying for every penny that we increase the motor fuel tax, uh, which is currently 19 cents a gallon. For every penny we increase it, the state gets $60 million. And they're talking about increasing the motor fuel tax per gallon from 19 cents to 44 cents. That's a 25 cent a gallon increase that would cost maybe the average vote, uh, driver around $1,000 or so, uh, depending upon obviously the miles driven but it could be close to a thousand dollars more. And that would, that would be per car if you're, if you're driving maybe a thousand miles a month. Um, and the other thing of course, is we have a sales tax on top of that. So then you're taxing the tax, but that going to 44 cents a gallon would bring in the state $1.5 billion. They're also talking about raising the fee on cars from $108 a month on the license tax to uh, 148 uh, dollars per car. And what if you have two or three cars, you can add the numbers up. There's uh, maybe another $500 or so, depending upon how many cars you have. So well, maybe. it's going to have an impact on this uh, right there, a lot, a lot of impact on middle class families. Whether or not that progressive tax ever goes down uh, is lowered to take in those making under $250,000. Middle class families still going to be picking up the tab, Jeff. Well, maybe we have to start uh, prioritizing. So this talk of a $30 billion capital budget, if it's going to be anything, maybe it needs more to be like the top priorities that may be five to 10 billion. Because, you know, there's some people talking about, oh, the Brookfield Zoo has infrastructure needs too. Why don't we put that in a capital? Budget? Well, as much as I like the folks from Brookfield and I like the Brookfield Zoo, it's a great place I've been there. Maybe the folks in Brookfield should take care of the Brookfield Zoo with admission fees and other things. I mean, when you go to when you're talking about taking the Brookfield Zoo infrastructure and putting that into this, you know, this capital funding bill for the state of Illinois, I mean, it's 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 gotten to the point where I'd say it's ridiculous. So I would think the taxpayers are gonna you're gonna have a major revolt if you see a thirty billion because ultimately somebody has to pay. They say, oh, you have to pay. We're just issuing bonds. <laughs> like who pays the principal and the interest on the bonds? 
So I, I want to show I, people I, uh, when we talk about the Capitol bill, I want to give a fun uh, photo here that was brought up and someone found this pothole that uh, looks exactly like the state of Illinois. It's pretty, uh, pretty good uh, representation there. And that brings us to the segment when we're talking about horizontal money and vertical money. And the horizontal money is uh, when we talk about fixing roads and bridges, Jeff. And then we, um, we also have the vertical money because some people want to have buildings put up and, and uh, different places around the state. Uh, but important for people to understand the distinction because we talked about this last time we had a show that uh, the monies because of the transportation lockbox that we raise, like from the gas tax, have to go to fund those things that are transportation projects, roads and bridges primarily, some rail, anything basically that falls under the umbrella of a tra uh, transportation project. Uh, so some buses, trains, that, that would get some of that money. Uh, but you can't be paying for uh, buildings to be going up, even if they're needed, or repairs for air conditioning units and colleges and uh, as such. You can't be paying for that through uh, some of those taxes uh, that we get from the gas tax. One of the big... Because, uh, you, because of the lockbox. Because of the lockbox, yeah, 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 that was passed uh, several years ago. Because people got tired of having the state government sweeping the money that was supposed to be going to roads and bridges out of the transportation funds. As time grows short in the show here, let's... Let's take a look to uh, Mark Polos, who's Executive Director of Operating Engineers 150, as he makes the case for a new capital bill. Not necessarily about the, the job creation through this bill as much as it is really about safety. I mean, it's, it, it, we've literally got Lakeshore Drive shut down. You've got 87th Street Bridge actually collapsing. Um, you've got a full depth hole down to the rebar over the Wren Lake uh, on the Wren Lake Bridge. You've got lane closures on I-55 on I of other full depth holes. I mean, you know, these aren't just about creating jobs. I mean, this is really about just safety of the motoring public. And there we go. So the need, according to Mark Polis, would be that, um, you know, safety because we, as he said, you know, we got places like Lakeshore Drive and other places around the state that they just, they just haven't been addressed as they should have been in the past. Well, Terry, we've just about covered, I think, most of the economic issues. We'll, we hope to be back doing this weekly next week as we roll toward the end of session. We should mention an important social issue that is on, it, it, some people say will be in, will be affected, will be legislated on. That's abortion. You know, there are bills that basically would remove complete the rights of the unborn. It would basically give, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, which people think may be an issue depend, because of the recent changes in the U.S. Supreme Court, possible future changes. So the Illinois legislatures are planning ahead and saying, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, here's what we want to be the law. They're going to try to structure it that way. There would be completely no rights to the unborn. You would take away a parent's right. Parents right now, if you want to put a band-aid on a kid practically, you got to get the parent's permission. Under this law, you can get an abortion, or the minor kid can get the abortion without without any notice to the parents. Right now, we have a judicial process in place, so if the individual, the minor, is sufficiently mature, you can bypass that parental notice. And in, in, in a number of cases, you should do that. We understand that. But there's that there's never right enough to, never enough time, Jeff, to get to all the issues. As we said, well, there's a lot going on here. Okay, and no more employee right of conscience. So we'll come back to that. What do we got? I mean, uh, we got like 20 seconds left, or is that <laughs> maybe 10? <laughs> maybe 10. So just remind people, we're going to try to do this every week, right, Terry? We're going to we're going to do what nobody else is doing, bringing a complete wrap up of Illinois as we go to the end of session, which presumably is May 31, and then we'll continue doing it because stuff continues to happen, even when this even when the legislature is out of session. All right, right, Terry. Thanks for joining us.